motorist who has time to spare and eyes to see, the countryside of the British Isles is an unending source of entertainment and interest. Panoramas of glorious rolling countryside, close-ups of rustic charm and glimpses of unspoilt nature abound side by side with regions of historical fact. History that worried us at school and intrigues us in our more mature years now stands as a living picture before our eyes. Here are castles and battlefields, cornerstones of our historic past, where it is easy to imagine the twang of the English bow and the war cry of the Scottish clans. These scenes, like a mellowed old book, have a natural attraction, and all but the blasé cannot fail to react to their romantic atmosphere. Yet a few more miles and modern engineering achievements stand stark and enduring against this background of British folklore and romance handed down from the early ancient Britons. Against this background of fact stands a pageant of the quaint and the curious. So let us forget the worries and troubles of modern life and entering our Morris journey out into this wonderful museum that is the highways and byways of Britain. For our first excursion, we will wander into the period of legend. Nearly everyone knows this gentleman and has probably blamed him for some misdeed. Like some of the people we know, untidiness is one of his features. For instance, here on Marlborough Downs is his den. Comfort does not seem to have worried him, as we should imagine the bed was remarkably hard and the windows somewhat drafty. His kitchen is in the mountains of North Wales near Bethesda, while on the outskirts of Cheltenham is his chimney. His satanic majesty is usually credited with supplying his own heat. If so, it must have been very smokeless, as this type of chimney looks extremely inefficient. That he had a voracious appetite is fairly obvious from the size of his beef tub, which is at Moffat in Scotland. At Hindhead in Surrey is his punch bowl, capable of holding a good many pints. From the size of his utensils, we should think he must have had a devil of an appetite. Yet he apparently preferred his food cooked, because on the outskirts of the tiny village of Camrai in Perthshire, hidden away in the dark recesses of the hills, is his cauldron. While we cannot guarantee the efficiency of this utensil, we certainly do admire its design. But what an untidy devil. Pots and pans scattered all over the country. Here, in the little village of Cadgeworth on the rough Cornish coast, is his reputed frying pan. Anyway, such a careless being is not worth worrying about. So let's turn to something more interesting. In the very early days of Britain, in fact, when Julius Caesar landed here, the ancient Britons were using boats made of skins bent over reeds dried in the wind. Surprising as it may seem, these boats practically unaltered, are today in use on some of the rivers in Wales. Time has marched so slowly in these quiet districts that the natives, who obtain a living by fishing for salmon on the rivers, still rely on the coracle for their livelihood. Practically the only change in design is that instead of dried skins, they used canvas covered with pitch or tar. This, of course, has the advantage of being more easily obtained and reduces the overall weight which is approximately 20 pounds. As the fishermen often have to carry these coracles on their backs to the fishing ground, this is of vital importance. As can be imagined, great skill is required to manipulate these tiny craft in the swift flowing waters, and the unusual manner of sculling should be noticed. While salmon fishing, the coracles work in pairs the net being stretched between the boats in the shape of a horseshoe. With the vast improvements in the design of aeroplanes and the huge expanse of the Air Force, we're inclined to look only to the future and forget the past. However, in a field in the north of Stanford, Northamptonshire, is a memorial to the first airman who was killed in an aeroplane accident. This was as long ago as 1899, and is earlier than most people realized that flights were being undertaken. Follies are erections usually built at the whim of some eccentric person. 
This is not always so, however, as in the case of the farmer's folly at Annick in Northumberland, this beautiful monument was erected by the tenants of the Duke of Northumberland in 1816 as an appreciation for lowering their rent. As they had not enough to complete the memorial, the Duke himself paid for the cost of finishing it. To provide the necessary funds, however, he raised their rents and reprimanded them for wasting their money. Here, on the outskirts of Halifax, is the Wayne House Tower. Rumour says it was built so that its owner could overlook his neighbour's property. This, however, is probably only local gossip, and it's much more likely that it was built as a chimney for the use of one of the factories in the valley below. The Brookman's Park Folly was erected in the 18th century by Sir Jeremy Sambrook as an entrance to his park. The gate, however, was never opened and was named a folly by the local people, who also were under the impression that the bricks were supposed to have one farthing between each. Travellers wandering in the New Forest are confronted with a huge concrete tower over 200 feet high, which rears its head above the surrounding foliage of the trees. This is known as the Peterson Folly and was originally built as a mausoleum for himself. It never fulfilled its designer's object for he was cremated and only his ashes rest in the base of this tower. Scotland has numerous follies but probably one of the most famous and incidentally one of the most picturesque is the McCaig Tower which overlooks the beautiful Bay of Oban. It was originally erected at a cost of approximately 5,000 pounds and is built of grey granite. Intended to house statues of the members of the designer's family, the will instructing such was contested and the judge held it to be a waste of money. Follies can often be a waste of money and one of the greatest is to fit any but genuine Morris spares to your car. And now let us travel into the region of the smallest things in England. Here at Fordwick in Kent is the smallest town hall. It is one of the oldest as well, the first mayor being installed here as long ago as 1292. By the side of a main road leading from the tiny village of Upleatham in Yorkshire is what is reputed to be the smallest church in England. It is only 13 feet wide and 17 feet long. It can seat only 15 people. In these days of rapid travel and huge mechanical monsters on the railways, it's amazing to find a full service being carried out with miniature engines and carriages on a track only 15 inches wide. Such, however, is the case with at least two railways in England which qualify for the title of the smallest. This particular one runs between Rumney, Hythe and Dimchurch on the southeast coast of Kent. The engines themselves are perfect pieces of engineering and are replicas of the giants which pull our main line expresses. No doubt, however, the saving in upkeep is very considerable, which reminds us that the car with the smallest upkeep cost is the Morris. This upkeep cost was probably the main influencing factor with the proprietors of this railway and is a fact worth considering when purchasing a new car. Grim, foreboding and yet majestic is the castle of Conway. It is visited by thousands of people every year, yet few of them know that nestling under the walls, in fact built into one of them, is the smallest house in Great Britain. Consisting of only two rooms, it nevertheless is a complete house. And now we come to the smallest inn. In the middle of the Thomas Hardy country, you see in the tiny village of Godmanston an inn called the Smith's Arms, which is reputed to be the smallest ever. Although only 15 by 11 feet, it has a miniature bar and there is still elbow room. From the smallest things, let us pass to the oldest, a most interesting section. The oldest signpost stands at the junction of Watling Street and Chester Road at Brown Hill in Staffordshire. In the village of Cowthorpe, at Weatherby, Yorkshire, is what remains of the oldest oak tree. Attributed to be over 1,600 years old, it is now a forlorn ruin of a majestic tree. The trunk was 60 feet across, and for years the lower branches had to be supported from the ground. The 
reputation of being the oldest inhabited house in England is enjoyed by a small public house in St Albans called the Fighting Cocks. Acknowledged to be over 1100 years old, it was originally the boathouse of a monastery built by Arthur, King of Mercia in the year 795. Here is another oldest tree, this time a yew, growing in the churchyard of Crowhurst in Sussex and reputed to be over 3000 years old. It is certainly a magnificent example of this particular type, which usually does not attain very large proportions. The oldest monument in England was cut about 600 AD and is in Cern Abbas, Dorset. It is supposed by local tradition to represent Heil, the pagan Saxon god. Here is man's reply to all these oldest efforts of nature. Henry Jenkins lived in the village of Ellerton near Richmond, Yorkshire and attained the incredible age of 169 years. He was reputed to have walked 15 miles every day and to have swum across the river when he was well over 100 years old. And now, let us see what Britain has to offer us in not so well-known history. Here, for instance, in Barnard Castle is a house called Broadgate. This was presented by Richard III to one Miles Forrest for his part in the murder of the twins and the tower. Being situated in what was then the remote county of Durham, it was well away from London and would be just the place to house a man who did not wish for publicity. Here is a better known example of English history. Hadrian's Wall, as it is called, was built by the Romans right across the north of England from coast to coast. At various places along the wall, forts were built in which legions of the Roman soldiers were housed. And there they carried on their occupations when not engaged in fighting. On three separate occasions, the wall was overthrown and rebuilt under the guidance of various prominent Roman emperors. This all occurred about 196 to 350 AD. The particular section which we show here is that which crossed the north of Cumberland and stretches on either side of Housted's Fort. These forts were really large camps and contained all the various houses usually associated with such. They were amazingly modern in their conception and were fitted with baths, granaries and workshops very similar to those of present times. Nearly every Englishman has heard of Stonehenge, but how many boast a knowledge of the stones at Avebury in Wiltshire? Strange as it may seem, this is by far the largest of the circles which have been discovered in this country. There were originally two circles inside a larger one with an avenue of stones leading into it comprising 450 stones. The origin and use to which this circle was put is hidden in antiquity, but it is generally assumed that it was erected in the early Bronze Age, about 1500 BC. Every Englishman knows Oxford and immediately associates it with its magnificent colleges and buildings. It is, however, a city of great age and was once one of the walled cities of England with four gates. Today, in the middle of one of its most beautiful streets, stands a magnificent memorial in the nature of a decorated cross. This is known as the Martyr's Memorial, but few people, if questioned, could tell you the reason for its erection. Actually, it commemorates the death of the ecclesiastics Ridley and Latimer, who were burnt at the stake just outside the city walls. The actual site of this deed is still marked by a granite cross set in the center of one of the main streets, namely the Broad. In the city of Lincoln is this old house, Situated under the eaves of the castle, it is of great historical value as it contains the cellar in which King John placed his treasure before he finally lost it in the wash. Public expressions of a king's feelings towards his queen are rare. When Edward I was bereaved of his queen, he was stricken with remorse. A magnificent funeral procession conveyed her body from Harvey to Westminster Abbey wherein she was buried. And to mark his affection and love, he had erected one of these beautiful crosses at each stage where the procession halted. There are now only three of these crosses still in existence, at Geddington, Hardingston, and Waltham Cross. Silent tributes of a king's great love. And now let us turn to one, and of, now the let us turn to one of the engineering sides of Britain. The bridges of this country probably have contributed more than any other factor to the advancement of trade and commerce. The early bridges were merely stones laid across other stones, and some of them are still in existence. With the spread of industry, more roads were built, more bridges began to make themselves apparent. 
the advent of railways demanded a larger type of bridge, and magnificent structures are now in existence. Outstanding among these are the bridges of Newcastle-upon-Tyne and the famous Forth Bridge in Scotland. The Forth Bridge is a magnificent example of the cantilever type and is an everlasting memorial to the skill of the British engineer. Talking of bridges and engineering reminds us that the Morris car is the finest bridge for any journey and that as an engineering achievement it is unequalled. Easily the most picturesque are the very beautiful hanging bridges of England. Among these is the Menai Bridge which joins the mainland with the Isle of Anglesey. High above the waters these graceful structures seem to be hanging on spiders' webs and yet are capable of carrying enormous weight. A further magnificent example of this type of hanging bridge is the one under Conway Castle, which crosses the river of that name. And now let us turn to the curious things which are scattered from Land's End to John O'Groats. Here, for instance, is magnificent Salisbury Cathedral in Wiltshire. It is visited by many, not only for spiritual reasons, but also on account of its beautiful architectural qualities. However, how many people know that it has as many windows as days in the year, as many pillars as hours in the year, 8,760, as many gates as moons in the year, and last but not least, that it has the loftiest spire in England, which is 404 feet high. At Farley Chamberlain in Hampshire is this rather weird conical-shaped construction. It is situated right on the top of a hill overlooking the Hampshire Downs and can be seen for many miles round. It was erected to the memory of a marvellous horse which, while hunting with its master, jumped into a chalk pit 25 feet deep in pursuit of the fox and yet was uninjured. On the outskirts of Oxfordshire, between the villages of Great and Little Rollwright, is an excellent example of an early stone circle. These are called the Rollwright Stones and were mentioned as early as 720 AD by the historian Bede. Stones of this type are naturally surrounded by legend and these particular ones are no exception. They are reputed to be on ground owned by a witch and a king who tried to conquer Britain came to this spot and with his soldiers was turned to stone by her. In a field at Standon Green End, Hertfordshire, is an unassuming looking stone mounted on end and surrounded by a small rail. If you take the trouble to cross the field, however, you will find on the top a bronze plate in which is inscribed how this stone marks the spot of the first balloon ascent in England. Towering above the trees on the outskirts of Lincoln Heath is a stone pillar surmounted by a statue of George III. This was originally a land lighthouse and had a lamp on the top in place of the statue to guide travellers at night across the vast open spaces of Lincoln Heath. The lantern was removed in 1880. Hickleton Churchyard in South Yorkshire possesses a lich gate which has a claim to notoriety. Let into the wall on the side of this gate and covered by a grill and plate glass are three human skulls. Inscribed beneath them are the words, Today for me, tomorrow for thee. The actual purpose of this seems doubtful, but as a reminder of the future it certainly has its merits. No doubt on the dark winter nights it had a very deterring effect on the local villagers. How many people know that the quaint little village of Largo was the birthplace of the original Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe? Alexander Selkirk was born here in 1676, and it was on his narrative and experiences that the famous novel was written. And now let's enter the last section, namely the picturesque. As far back as records can go, poems have been written and ballads sung, all extolling the charm of our beautiful country. Go where you will, Scotland, Wales or England, this trinity offers you unending pleasure. The solitude of the Scottish moors, the quiet peacefulness of the English village, the ruggedness of the Welsh mountains, the Cornish coast waging its continual battle with the Atlantic rollers, London, the hub of the world with its historical background, all these and hundreds of others 
make a museum of interest unequaled in the world. There is no charge to enter, only a key required to admit you to this unending panorama. And what better key than the Morris car? The owner of a Morris, like the character in a famous fairy tale, can say open sesame to any and every section and can enter and enjoy this realm of facts and fancies that is Britain. Britain offers you her hospitality. The Morris car offers you comfort and reliability. Let Morris be your guide.